does the word meaning denote in the expression meaning of life? Is it a directive, a feeling, or something else entirely? Well, I think it's, it's not a straightforward matter to discuss the meaning of life, right? Because it's pretty clear that there are multiple meanings, and those meanings are associated with different events and situations. Um, I think you can still intelligently, intelligently address the issue of the meaning of life because meanings tend to arrange themselves into a hierarchy of value and relevance, and they have to do that because otherwise there's nothing but, as, as uh, William James suggested, sort of a blooming and buzzing confusion. So the issue is multiple meanings in a unified, integrated framework. Um, meaning is partly an impetus for action. It's very important to remember that human beings are active and living creatures and that one of our primarily our primary problems, in fact, perhaps our primary problem, is how to act in the world. But that also involves other questions like how to perceive, how to prepare for action, how to plan for action in the future. And so all of those questions are associated with meaning. Like for me, meaning is a is the, is the abstract impetus towards action, fundamentally. And it's an important thing to give some consideration to because part of the Western intellectual tradition um, tends to abstract rationality or consciousness from embodiment. And it's very much the case that we are embodied creatures. You know, the idea that our brain is in our head and that our mind is in our brain is, um, it's a useful idea for certain purposes, but it obscures much while shedding light on other things. So meaning is tightly associated with action, with the abstraction of action, but then also with the construction of the perceptual frameworks and emotional responses that are necessary to conceive of the world in a manner that allows you to act in it. So one of the things we know, for example, is that when you walk into a room like this and you see the, the furniture of the landscape arrayed in front of you, that one of the things that you directly perceive is actually the meaning of that furniture. And you might think that you see the object and infer the meaning, and that's what you would think if you were a traditional Western rationalist or even a materialist, but it actually seems to be the case that when you walk into a room like this, the, the room tells you what to do at a level that's below conscious realization. And it's, it's partly because, well, you know exactly what chairs are for. You might ask yourself, for example, what is a chair? It's a complicated question because it could be a beanbag and it could be a stump. But fundamentally, a chair is something to sit in. And when you see a chair, the sh chair tells you directly as a perceptual consequence that you sit in it. And that's the meaning of the chair. And so you can't understand meaning in that manner without considering meaning in relationship to embodiment. And so meaning is really how we propel ourselves through the world and how we organize ourselves and arrange to propel ourselves through the world in a manner that's um, productive, relatively free of suffering, even though that's a meaning, and sustainable across many situations and contexts. So that's, that's a rough framework for the initiation of the discussion. <clears throat> uh, for me, I think uh, the first thing I would say is the word meaning is being used as a metaphor. Um, we're taking basically a term from uh, language, uh, a sentence is meaningful, and we're using it metaphorically to try and denote something that um, um, is probably um, pre-linguistic, although it shows up in our language. I mean, a sentence is, is, is meaningful in that it does something to information in such a way that we get a fundamental connection between ourselves and the world. And I think that's, for me, what is fundamentally going on when we talk about meaning. We're talking about the fact that uh, there's a fundamental process of selection that the brain, the embodied brain, which I, I, I agree with you is a very important uh, thing to constantly remind ourselves of, has to face. There's way too much information available at all times. And of all of that information, uh, only some of it is going to be useful or helpful to an organism. And somehow that information has to be found. It has to be found in a very reliable manner it has to be transformed into a form that is relevant to this body in, in this world such that I can uh, s s frame problems, solve problems, achieve my goals. And the, that process of zeroing in on relevant information, what I call relevance realization, means that we 
are fundamentally thrown into a atmospheric kind of relationship to the world. Um, there's a salience landscape constantly being projected at all times of how things stand out to you, what gathers your attention, what arouses your uh, metabolic resources or dampens them, uh, what uh, creates certain motivational and affective states. Because this relevance realization process is not a cold calculation like a computer. It's instead a deep involvement uh, between the organism and its world. And that involvement has, um, as Jordan says, it's often and most prominently going on uh, below consciousness. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's an ongoing evolving process. I mean, one minute something is salient. Look, that became salient to you. Now it's not salient anymore. So that process is constantly evolving. And so we shouldn't think of meaning as a static thing, but this ongoing process by which the organism is constantly fitting itself to the world and having the world fitted to it so that its actions can be undertaken in a fluent manner. Now, the thing that I think is very important about this meaning-making process, or as I, like, as I prefer to call it, relevance realization, because I think meaning is standing in as a metaphor for that, is that this process is um, it's below our consciousness, it's below our rationality, it's below our language use, it's below our deliberative reasoning, uh, precisely because it's constitutive or presupposed by all those processes. Until you do relevance realization, you can't use a language. Until you do relevance realization, you can't form representations. Until you do relevance realization, you can't even form your own autobiographical identity. The world as a place that has categories and you as a cognitive agent with a sense of identity in it both co-spring from this relevance realization. It is a deep binding of you and the world at a fundamental level. And that's why when it's threatened in any fashion, uh, human beings will experience a deep kind of trauma, absurdity, horror, a deep kind of anxiety. And so when I think people are talking about meaning in life, what they're trying to gesture towards is they have structures in place that maintain and enhance that relevance realization such that two things are possible. They can reliably keep at bay absurdity and horror, and they can reliably afford the ongoing evolution, the growth of that relevance realization so that they can find some kind of fulfillment in that, in that identity that they are cultivating for themselves as a cognitive agent and the world in which they, into which they are fitted. And so I think the degree to which uh, people are talking about meaning in life is the degree to which they're talking about those kinds of structures that affect that co-creation out of relevance realization of cognitive agency and a world in which cognitive agents can solve problems in an intelligible manner. We, we should also maybe decide if we agree on something. That We're going to agree good. on many things, I, I suppose. And a lot, of, a lot of a discussion like this is often terminological, and it's partly going to be the case between John and I, because his intellectual background is different than mine, although it overlaps in some important ways. And so partly what I'm hoping to do with the discussion tonight is to make sure that we actually understand each other. This is definitely not a debate in which one of us is going to win. What, what we're hoping to do is to have the kind of conversation that allows for the scaffolding and the further development of ideas, Agreed. which is really what an intellectual conversation is. So I, I want to offer you a couple of propositions and tell me what you think about them. Sure. I mean, the first thing is that I don't believe that the question, does life have meaning, is actually a reasonable question. I don't think it's properly formulated. And the reason I believe that is because that isn't really what people are want, want to know when they ask that question. No. I mean, life has lots of meanings, right? The Buddhists would say that life is suffering. And, you know, we might not think about suffering as meaning, but fundamentally it's anxiety and pain and with some disgust thrown in there maybe for good measure. <laughs> and, and those are meanings. And even if you're nihilistic and you're, you're not oriented towards a belief in some sort of ultimate meaning structure, that doesn't mean you can escape from the meaning of life. What it does mean is that the meaning of your life is misery, suffering, anxiety, and a real decrement in quality. So we're, we're, we're trapped inside the question of the meaning of life. There's no getting outside of it. You can say there's no ultimate meaning, but then you have to define ultimate. So, and then the, the other thing that I thought... So let me just make sure yeah. I got the first proposition. Yeah, okay. Uh, the first proposition is you, the question, I want to make sure I got your wording right, does life have a meaning is ill-posed? Do you yes. want me to, I just want to store that, I can either respond or wait till you put your second question out. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, well... Um, I'm just want, I just don't want to lose the first question. Well, the, the other thing second. that might be useful clarifying, I mean, 
I understand what you mean by relevance realization. I, ter I have a formulation of it in my own, yeah. in my own language. But, um, so I'm going to make a couple of comments on that as well, and you can tell me if, sure. if you agree or disagree on that. So one of the things that's quite... One of the ways that you can approach the idea of meaning is by making a separate assumption about what the fundamental structures in the world are. I mean, materialists and empiricists tend to believe that the fundamental structures are, we'll say, atomic particles, even though we know we can go higher resolution than that. There's atomic particles and there's the space in which they're distributed. And what that means is that the combination of quantum particles, quantized particles, plus space allows for the array of physical entities in patterns, right? Like music is a pattern. And it's, it's, there seems to me that there's something profoundly similar about patterns and information. And it seems to me that what we experience as meaning is something like our interaction with information. Now, I just want to say one more thing about that. The problem with information in some sense is that there's too much of it. Yes. And so one of the things you could say about life's meaning is that there's absolutely way too much of it. You know, and you, you can certainly experience that if you ever have an experience of awe or even of, of, of overwhelming absurdity. Those are both quasi-religious experiences. So relevance realization is actually, as far as I can tell, it's the limitation of what's essentially a in, close to infinite field of information that's so rich that it can't be exhausted into a narrower form that's focal and useful for this particular time, in this particular place, for this particular set of activities. Right. So it's a narrowing process. Is in, that? Yeah, okay, so uh, I'll respond to the second thing first, because that will actually help me to respond to your, your first question about the posing of the question. Yeah, I think that's a good way of putting it, um, and that although I would want to emphasize that I don't think that process is just a selection process, it's, it's an important transformation process. Um, because uh, we do something to the information, uh, and you, were ref you, you made reference to this in the embodiment. It's not just that we have sort of passively taken in the information or selected it from the environment. We, we, it's not, we make the pieces, like you say, we find patterns. It's how the pieces are relevant to each other, how they're relevant to us. Again, and I'm trying to emphasize this, not just as some so, sort of cold calculation about that information, right. but in a way in which, I mean, we, we say it like we make sense. It's, it's, a, it's constitutive of our, of our cognitive agency. Just like our bodies uh, take in matter, but they don't just select the matter, they transform it and restructure it so we have the ability to operate in the world. Our minds don't just select the information, they take in it, they transform it and structure mm -hmm. it so analogous to our bodies, we gain skills and abilities to interact with that world from which that information was that's selected. Why, that's why I think people love to watch bands improvise, because really what they're doing, if they're really, especially if they're doing it collectively, is they're engaging in a collective process of the spontaneous transmutation of patterns. And I think the reason that people find that so deeply meaningful is because it is a representation, like an ongoing abstract artistic representation. I think it's, a, of, it's an exemplification. Yes, of, of the, what we do in the world. That's right. I think one of the reasons why we like art is we play with the variance relative. We were, we're playing in the, in, the, in the Piagetian sense of playing, in the sense of developing our skills. We play with the relevance realization machinery for its own sake. Mm -hmm. But that allows me to go back to your, I think, asking you know, for the meaning of life uh, it carries with it sort of, pre like even saying the meaning in life, uh, hmm. it carries with it the presupposition that meaning is, uh, is sort of there uh, to be found, and it, it immediately steers us away from this ongoing process, right, in which we're taking in information, uh, transforming it, uh, structuring it, altering ourselves, fitting to a world that is then also, still, also itself restructuring itself, changing itself, and so there's this ongoing evolving relationship. So one of the reasons why I don't like the question, the meaning of life, is it proposes a ready-made answer to be found. It, 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 it presupposes a static thing to be discovered, or even a static relation to be realized. And, and it also carries with it the idea that um, there, it, it's like, like you said, it, it's like there is um, an answer to a question that has been posed. When I don't think the issue facing us is a riddle or a question in that sense to, that some proposition will satisfy. I don't think there's anything that, I'm sorry, this will sound incredibly pretentious, but I'm being asked about I think. I don't think there's anything. <laughs> I'm it, trying to make him sound pretentious. Right. I, mean. I, don't, I don't think there's a proposition that anybody can say to you that will render your life meaningful. I mean, you might do things with that proposition 
that might uh, fit you better to the world so that horror becomes less prevalent and flourishing becomes more prominent. Mm -hmm. But I don't, uh, to think that the answer is in the proposition is to misunderstand the role of propositions in our cognition. The propositional level is very high up and sits on many recursive levels of relevance realization that only at their very tip produce this kind of propositional processing. Re me the meaning is much more our knowing how to interact with the world, knowing how, look, knowing how to fit my hand to this glass is part of that process. And that's not based on sort of just, it, it's not primarily based on my beliefs about the glass, it's based on much more complex dynamical system by which my body, my perception, the glass, the atmosphere are fitting together so that I can grasp the glass. So, well, one of the things that, that I found interesting, I learned this, I think, mostly from uh, Gibson, who wrote a book called... Right. Eco yeah, you know... The Ecological the book. Approach to Visual yeah, Perception. Yeah. So, yeah. one of the things Gibson presupposes, it's, uh, it's a very interesting... He has a very interesting way of looking at the world. And, and it's, it's tied deeply into our fundamental presuppositions about the structure of reality. Because one of the big issues about meaning, in some sense, is whether it's fundamentally constituent, cons, cons, constitutive of reality, or if it's a, what would you call an emergent property of something more fundamental. Now, the answer to that question, in part, is exactly what do you mean by reality? And it also, the question is also, what do you mean by truth? And these aren't, this mm. isn't Pontius Pilate's question. It's a whole different kind of question. Right. Now, the, the, the modern neuroscientists, in some sense, following Gibson, make the claim that when you look at a glass like that, that what happens in your brain is that the pattern of the glass maps itself onto the pattern of your gripping hand, and that maps itself onto the pattern of pouring and, and drinking. And that a lot of that happens before, potentially, before or alongside your conscious perception of the glass as an object. Mm -hmm. So we know, for example, that are, there are people who claim to be blind who can still map objects onto their body. So, okay, so that's called blind sight. So, when, so developing that idea, it, it's appeared to me that there's good evidence that what we see when we look at the world is meaning. We don't see objects and infer meaning. We see meaning and we infer objects. And, and so then the question is, well, is the meaning real? And then the answer to that is, well, what do you mean by real? And, and I'll, it'll only take me a minute to lay this out. Okay. This starts to depend on whether you're a Darwinian or a Newtonian. If you're a Newtonian, then the real thing is the material object. But if, and we also know that Newton in some important ways was wrong. But if you're a Darwinian, and you almost have to be a Darwinian, I, I really don't see any escape from it, unless you don't know what you're talking about fundamentally. <laughs> um, there's reasons for that, is that the thing that the, the thing, <laughs> The thing that determines whether or not you're going to survive and propagate, which is, by the way, the best solution you can possibly answer to the problem of life if you're a biological organism and you have a Darwinian philosophy, the question you're trying to answer is, what is the appropriate meaning to perceive in each environment? Because that determines your action, and your action, the consequences of your action, determines whether you, know, you survive and propagate. And so if you take the question of meaning from a Darwinian perspective, you can actually say, as far as I can tell, that the fundamental constituent elements, at least of experience and perhaps of reality itself, are the meanings that you perceive before you infer the object. Now, you know, that's a pretty radical ontological claim, and I've never heard anyone else actually make it, except for maybe the pragmatists. It's a pragmatic, it's a variant of pragmatic philosophy, but I've tried to wrap my head around that argument and see if I can destroy it, but I can't. So. I'm just wondering if, you know, what you think about that. I have a lot to think about that and a lot to say about it. Uh, first of all, um, let, before I, I get into the Darwinian um, Newtonian thing, which I've seen you do a couple times before and I've always found it very interesting. It's one of my little tricks. It, it's one of your, <laughs> you, you belittle it, it's one of your good tricks. I mean, it's a very good one. It's a very good point. Um, first of all, the question, I, I do think that that fittedness to the world does create, I think Plato had a fantastic insight that above, any, above and beyond any particular desire we have, we have a desire for what we desire to be real in some sense. One of the ways to rob meaning from your life is to suddenly realize that a bunch of things, a bunch of the things you've desired or the bunch of the things that you thought made you happy are illusory in some sense. In fact, people will do a bizarre thing, and I do this every time in uh, a class. I'll, I'll ask 
How many of you are in, you know, uh, really satisfying, deeply satisfying personal relationships? Um, and surprisingly, many people put up their hands. Um, um, <laughs> Those are the self-deceptive ones. And then, and, and then I, <laughs> yeah. and then, and then I do the following. I say, how many would, you, how many of you would want to know if your partner was cheating on you, such that it would destroy the relationship? And almost all of them put their hands back up again. Name, name, name. So they would rather have the truth than have all of that other stuff that they find so good be illusory. And I think that was one of Plato's profound insights. This connectedness to reality is a fundamental drive in us. Now, you know, John, when you're asking that, you're basically asking people whether or not if they were in a perfect garden, they'd be willing to check out the snake. Yes, right. Yeah. And, I, I, and I, the I, answer, of course, we all know is that, well, of course, people will check out the snake, snake. because that's just what we're like. And, and I think, but I do think there's something important to that. I think ultimately, uh, you know, the platonic orientation towards truth is grounded in that notion of a deeper drive towards real. I think asking the question about whether or not meaning is real, um, part of it, I, I want to challenge the presupposition behind the question first, because the presupposition behind that are on, is that only things are real and that relationships, relations between things aren't real. And I think it is very, re it, so it might strike people as odd for me to say, yes, of course, I think uh, relevance is real. I don't think it's part, and this is where I might differ with you, but I think we'll have to negotiate it. I don't think it's part of the physical uh, fabric of the universe. Uh, nor do I think it is it just a subjective illusion on our head. It is a real relation uh, between us and the environment, just like evolution is a real relation okay. between an organism and its environment. Okay. It's not a property okay. of the so, environment. It's not a property of the organism. It's a real relation between them that explains the, both the history of the organism and the history of the environment. Okay, so that would be a lovely thing to see if we can get clear, because that's, that's a very profound argument, like a profound uh, debate. Sure. You know, there are, there are Heideggerians who took opposite positions on that. Yes, I'm aware of that. And yeah. So, and some of them were psychologists, right? And mm -hmm. so, I'm just going to outline it for the audience and to make sure we're thinking about it the same way. One stance is that um, meaning, so to speak, is a consequence of the operation of these elaborate patterns of construction in your mind and that you're imposing that on the world. Right. So it's that's, like a structure issue. Yeah, that's a romantic issue yeah, of meaning. Yeah. yeah, and then the other one is that, no, no, meaning is is in the world, so to speak, and that what you do with the structures in your head is limit it and narrow it. Mm. And I think some, in some weird way, both of those things are true. But, but here's something that, that I, I've been thinking about for a long time, and, and I want you to maybe help me figure out a bit more. So I'm going to go at this from two perspectives. So uh, back in the late 1800s, Nietzsche basically formalized a set of observations about what he thought was happening in Western society and the then the world at large, right? right? And the basic argument was something like this, was that the metaphysical presuppositions of religious systems and the metaphysical presuppositions of scientific systems were not in sync. They, were, they, were, they weren't of the same paradigm. And that as Western scientific investigation had proceeded, it became, it became obvious that either the truths of religion weren't true, or at least that they weren't of the type that science recognized as truth. And Nietzsche basically described that as the death of God. And so he said that three things would happen in the aftermath of that. Um, he was a prophet, you know, he was like an Old Testament prophet. Um, he said that totalitarianism would become unbelievably attractive to people, especially in its hyper-socialist variants like communism, and that millions of people would die in the 20th century as a consequence of that, and that it would be a necessary battle. And he said that like 40 years before the Russian Revolution, and so like, yeah, go Nietzsche. He's like, you try to predict the future like five years ahead, see how far you get. And then the other thing he said would, that, would be that nihilism would rise to, to, to uh, pathological proportions because it's basically the polar opposite of totalitarianism, right? You wipe out the religious structures, people move towards ideology to reattain that certainty, but it's rigid and, mm -hmm. and, and deadly, or they fall off into chaos itself. Okay, then Nietzsche made one more proposition, which was that the only solution to that would be for human beings to transform themselves into meaning-creating creatures. And so what Nietzsche basically did, and I think this was a mistake in his metaphysics, was that he assumed that the objective description of reality was correct, that reality in and of itself was dead and meaningless, 
but that human beings could interact with that in such a way as a consequence of their individual choices to make that richly meaningful. And that we needed to do that because the al alternatives would be nihilism or totalitarianism. One more sure. comment on that. So, you know, Jung was a student of Nietzsche's, a, a profound student. And he was actually trying to solve the problem that Nietzsche put forward, which was, oh, well, we got nihilism on the one hand and we got totalitarianism on the other hand. And, you know, those don't really seem to be very good solutions since millions of people die because of one and millions of people commit suicide because of the other. It's like those are suboptimal solutions in all likelihood. So, but, but Jung in some sense took issue with Nietzsche's fundamental proposition, which was that human beings were meaning creating creatures. And I actually think it's the most profound critique of Nietzsche because, because what Jung pointed out, and this is something that just blew me away when I first understood it, and it has to do with your relevance realization issue in, in a deadly way. It's like, imagine the things that attract your attention and your interest. Well, okay, so then you might think, well, is that a voluntary process or an involuntary process? And to answer that, you can think about it. It's like you're, you're working on some dismally wretched, boring and stultifying thing at work or as a student, and your, your attention is like fragmented everywhere. You think about the dust bunnies under your bed and that maybe the dishes need to be done and the dog needs to be walked and the, you know, the rug needs to be vacuumed and it's like bloody well anything other than that boring task. Even though you know you have to do it in order to, say, pass a course or pass an exam or get the assignment done, you can't control your damn brain. It's wandering everywhere. You know, and then, so, so the weird thing about that is that you cannot voluntarily control your relevance realization. And then you have the contrary problem, which is that, you know, there's a YouTube video about kittens and it's like, bang, man, you're focused on that, <laughs> you know. And so one of the things you might ask, is just who the hell's in control of this relevance realization? And that was Jung's question. It was like, well, where Nietzsche fell apart, Nietzsche fell apart, was that he assumed that human beings were primarily meaning-making creatures. But then if you try it, you know, it's like, hey, I'm gonna find it really meaningful to go to the gym three times a week next week for half an hour, and I'm gonna push myself right to my limits. It's like, I have every reason for doing it. I know why I should do it, but I'd rather sit on the couch, you know, in my underwear and eat cheaties. Cheetos. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so you've got to ask yourself, man, who's in charge? And one of the things that the psychodynamic theorists were so damn good at was pointing out that, well, you think it's you, but it's not. And so then that begs the question. It's like, where's the meaning coming from? And who is in charge? And so I know that's the questions that you're trying to answer, but it doesn't exactly seem to me that we're overlaying that on the world or that if we are, we don't have much voluntary control over that. Okay, well, um, I don't think we're overlaying it on the world and I, that's what I meant by a real relation and I was comparing it to evolution. I, I think uh, to talk about us being meaning makers in the Nietzschean sense is to fall prey to uh, the romantic illusion uh, that the world is a blank slate I mean, you, you have the blank slate of the Enlightenment in which, you know, reason, the world writes on us, and then you have the blank slate of the Romantics in which the world is a blank slate, like the painted, the unpainted canvas that we, and that mm -hmm. Nietzsche mm -hmm. constantly used the artistic metaphor, and he even created the idea of a lifestyle, as if our lives are works of art because the world is just an empty canvas mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. upon which we project mm -hmm. our right. meaning. Well, and there's totalitarian presuppositions in there too because one of the presuppositions of totalitarian ideologues is that there is no such thing as human nature and that people can be constructed in any way possible. Exactly, and that's why existentialism comes out of Nietzsche because ex existentialism posits that our essence and our nature is completely of the property of our own self-definition. So what I'm, what I'm actually doing is I'm rejecting both of those blank slates. I'm saying the world is neither a blank slate that we romantically project upon, nor is the mind a blank slate that, ex that experience just empirically draws upon. What I'm, my, what I'm proposing is in, instead is a dynamic interaction between the two. And to say that, you know, uh, who's in charge is, 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 kind of an, is kind of an odd question, but I, before I, I, I answer that, I want to take a little bit of exception on your inter interpretation of Nietzsche, um, because I think uh, it might help, um, and it also might get us back to the, the Newton-Darwin thing, which I promised to get back to, too. 
I mean, Nietzsche lays, and I, I mean, and again, uh, uh, Heidegger followed up on this. He actually lays the, the, the history of nihilism much further back, right? He says that the, the history of nihilism starts with Plato and, uh, and that Christianity is just Plato for the masses. Because my interpretation of Nietzsche is that the main cause of nihilism was, goes back to like the acts of revolution. It's the creation of the, du the two world model. And, and the idea is that this world gets its meaning, right, its value, it, it has an instrumental value in getting us to some other world to some world in which we will finally find the fulfillment and the protection from horror that we don't find in this world. So a heaven and, right? Mm -hmm. And then what happens, right? The way, in, the way in, it wasn't just the clash between the scientific and the, world, uh, the religious worldview. What happens is that the scientific worldview calls the second world, the heavenly world, into question. But mm -hmm. what's happened is we have millennia of Christianity and Platonism tutoring us to believe that this world is not meaningful in itself because yeah. it's only valuable insofar as we get to this heaven. And then once science says, ah, imagine that there is no heaven, so all we're John left, Lennon. or John Lennon, yeah. right? Yeah. Then we're left, <laughs> my favorite Beatle, we're left, right? That, that really dates me, doesn't it? Uh, uh, that, then we're left with this world that we've been tutored for millennia has no, has no value in it. And so uh, I think the, what Nietzsche was trying to do, I, I agree with you, there's a romantic streak in Nietzsche, and like I said, I reject that romantic streak that the world is a blank slate upon which we paint mm -hmm. our lifestyles. Mm -hmm. uh, that is ridiculously hubristic in nature. Mm -hmm. um, but there was another thing Nietzsche was trying to do, and so I think there's, I mean, Nietzsche has multiple voices in yes, his anything. Yes, yes, yes. So in addition to the romantic project, which I often find really bombastic, there is another project that he called trying to revalue the earth which was to try to see the earth as a place in which we could be at home in its, on its own terms, for its own sake, hmm. that we could but find... that was more Heidegger, I think. No, no, no Heidegger talked... Nietzsche talks about revaluing, learning how to revalue the earth and loving the earth is a repeated theme throughout Nietzsche's work. And loving the body is a repeated mm -hmm. theme in Nietzsche's work. And to, because he thought that just like we had the two worlds, we had the two parts of us. We had the body, but the body only existed in service of the soul. And the body, yeah. therefore, has no in, in, inherent value because mm -hmm. its only job is to get the soul to the only place where it has real meaning, which is heaven. Mm -hmm. And then his point was, if we lose the heaven and if we lose the idea of the soul, we have to get back to revaluing the body, mm -hmm. revaluing the earth. And what I'm proposing in this sort of evolutionary model of relevance realization is exactly that the body and the earth co-create this real relation that fundamentally homes us and fits us into the world. And that the meaning crisis, and therefore, it, it's not just, I mean, yes, I agree, there are definitely historical uh, forces for it, and the rise of science, and the, and the demise of the, of the wisdom traditions, and the religious traditions. Mm -hmm. But I think the meaning crisis is, is, is in some right. sense also a perennial problem. You see it cross-culturally, you see it cross-historically. Because people can always get trapped between these two kinds of perspectives they can have on themselves. They can always fall prey to these kinds of two world models. And so, I think the, 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 the thing I want to say is um, part of what's going on right now in the meaning crisis in the West is we're trying to, and this is the way Nietzsche, I think, was prescient, as you said, he was, he was a prophet. Uh, by the way, he predicted four things. He predicted that he would be famous eventually. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> um, Although that he would basically starve to death in the meantime. Right, but he, yes. you know, why I am so great was yeah. one of his... Timing is everything. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. Um, and, and so um, uh, what he was prescient about is the fact that, I mean, basically since the actual age in 800 you know, BCE and onward, we've had this two-world model. And now we're going through a, a radical re-embedding. For a lot of people, that's caused a, a kind of nihilism. But one of the things I would throw out to you is that there's a possibility in, a, in an emerging cognitive science, and a cognitive science in which embodiment and embeddedment are becoming central, for appropriating that re-embedding process as a way of discovering, rediscovering um, how we can be at home, fundamentally at home in the world, and how the earth and our bodies co-create that home in a way okay. that, again, protects us from horror and allows us to flourish as cognitive okay. agents. Okay, so you, you did something I think is lovely, and, and I don't think that it's people who aren't quite deeply educated can do, is you pushed the problem quite a bit farther back in time. 
So I want to one up you on that. Okay. <laughs> so I do think it's a deeper problem than, than, than Nietzsche pointed out. He pointed out the, the more articulated modern end of it, you know, and yep. we see that as the conflict, say, between science and religion. But if you, you can push these sorts of things back, I think, to the dawn of self-consciousness itself. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons that I've been so obsessed with the book of Genesis is because I read Genesis as a, uh, a dramatic representation of the coming to self-consciousness of mankind. Because what happens with, with Adam and Eve when they eat the fruit that the snake delivers to them, which is very ev interesting sort of phenomena from an evolutionary perspective, which I can talk about later. What happens to Adam and Eve is very, very specific. I mean, the first thing that happens, I'm sorry, I might get the order wrong, but the first thing that happens is that they realize that their eyes are opened and they're like gods knowing the difference between good and evil. And that's very interesting, eh? Because it, it associates the development of self-consciousness and the rise of articulated and, and, and complicated morality. And so I thought about that for a long time. It's like, okay, you realize you're naked. What does that mean? Well, you don't want to be naked up here on the stage, although if you're speaking properly to the audience, you are. But maybe you don't want that. Okay, well, why? Why don't you want to be up here naked on the stage? It's everyone's nightmare, right? Well, you know, you're kind of flawed and saggy, and, you know, there's parts of you that are not that beautiful, <laughs> <laughs> even if you happen to be a supermodel. You know, and you're not as bright as you could be, and you know, your hair might be going a little bit, and you know, your teeth aren't that great, and you're not as smart as you could be, and you got a lot of flaws, plus you're gonna get sick, and then you're gonna die. It's like, that, that <laughs> right, right. So that's a lot of, that's all nakedness, if you think about nakedness as vulnerability. And so we had to come to terms with her vulnerability when we became self-conscious. So then you might think, well, what the hell does that have to do with morality? And I did figure that out. It took me like 15 years of thinking to figure that out. It's like. If I know I'm naked and vulnerable, and I know you are the same, then I know what will hurt me. And once I know I, what will hurt me, I know what will hurt you. And so, you know, animals prey on each other. Lions eat, eat gazelles, and, you know, worms eat lions, and all of that. And, but there's nothing like a human being for sheer, outright, atrocious torture. And you don't get that without self-consciousness. So that's where I think the knowledge of good and evil comes. It's like it's no longer prey and predator. It's like torturer and victim. So, so that's one thing. So, okay. so, and part of that sets up this dichotomy in human beings between whatever it is that our consciousness seems to be and our self-consciousness and this terrible, limited burden that we carry around as a, as a body that we're conscious of. So there's, there's that dichotomy, that dichotomy emerges back at the beginning of, of the dichotomy of self-consciousness. Mm -hmm. It's a problem we're trying to solve all the time. That's, and yeah, that's and I mean, I Nietzsche's criticism of Christianity was that he, he believed that Christianity um, failed to solve that problem because instead of dealing with the reality of the catastrophe, which is, say, the degenerate form of our material body, the, the church basically damned that to perdition, describing it as a work of the devil, so to speak, and then concentrated on spiritual salvation. Now, you knew this element of, 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 uh, of Christian religious thought and the Nietzschean transformations of that, and that's part of the reason why he went back to alchemy. Because one of the things Jung was interested in was, why did science develop? You know, it, it only developed in Europe, as far as we know, and like the Greeks didn't have it, and the Romans didn't have it, and the Chinese didn't have it, and the Indians didn't have it, and it's like, well, they weren't stupid. What was up with them, and why Europe? What, what exactly happened there? It's not like we precisely know the answer to that, but one of the things that Jung suggested, and it's brilliant as far as I'm concerned, was that the, the cognitive apparat apparatuses that we're blessed with are compensatory. So that if we formulate a theory about one domain and take it to a, a real extreme, we'll, 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 the unconscious mind will start to formulate a counter proposition, which is formulated of all the things we notice that don't fit in with that theory. And then they start to flap around and, and associate with each other as a consequence of emotional contagion. And they start to manifest themselves in patterns. And that once that counterposition emerges as a sufficiently complex and dynamic living system, it has the opportunity to fight with the other system. And sometimes you'll have a revelation. And the revelation is basically the overthrow of the current perspective by the new emergent perspective. So 
And Jung viewed alchemy in that light. He said that the Christian concentration on hyper-spiritualization was extremely useful. This is something Nietzsche agreed with, was unbelievably useful for the discipline of the mind. Mm -hmm. So Nietzsche, of course, is an anti-Christian, at least that's what he said. But he also said that Catholicism tempered the European spirit like nothing else could have. And he really meant the whole Judeo-Christian tradition, which was the attempt to force everything into a unified and hierarchically arranged interpretation. Nietzsche's idea was once you did that once, man, you could go do that all sorts of different places. So, all right. So alchemy as a, pre as a precursor to science was based on initially on a fantasy. And the fantasy was if we paid enough attention to the transformations of matter rather than of spirit, that we could redeem what Christianity, with its emphasis on the spirit, had failed to redeem. So it was sort of like all the 14th century Europeans woke up and said, hmm, Christ died for our sins and you know we're supposed to be redeemed, but a lot of guys down there with leprosy in the ditch, so it doesn't seem to have exactly you know, fulfilled its promise. And so he felt that the European imagination started to drift into the transformations of the material world. But, that, that, but, that, but that, that was also part of what was fundamentally a redemptive process. It was just a more comprehensive redemptive process. It was, all right, well, we kind of got the spirit organized. Now it's time to do something about the dreadful body that we're dragging around with us instead of merely damning it to perdition. And one of the things that you might think about, because we're also thinking about practical issues here is, well, we talked about multiple meanings kind of multiple low-level meanings. There's the meaning of food, and the meaning of water, and the meaning of sex, and you know, the meaning of being too hot and too cold, and there's all biological subsystems that take care of those sorts of things. It's like, those are organized hierarchically in principle, so there's something lurking at the top. And I think part of what religious mythologies do over years, centuries, thousands of years, is try to get a picture of what should be at the top. That's like the monotheistic impulse. What's the highest value? And here's something to, to consider. You, know, you can wonder about this in your own lives when people think about the meaning of their life. What they mean is, are all the subsidiary meanings meaningful given that there's an ultimate reality of suffering and limitation? And so one of the things that might be asked, and I think that scientists do ask this in part is, um, maybe we shouldn't deal with that question be before we fix everything we can possibly fix. And so one of the things that I would also suggest is that when you're motivated by meanings that are other than subsidiary, say the same meanings that, that animate mammals and reptiles and even bloody lobsters for that matter, when you're, when you're working at higher order levels of meaning, partly what you're attempting to do is to generate solutions to the micro problems of negative meaning that always beset you. You know, it's like, well, is there something wrong in your family? Well, that's meaningful. It's, the meaning is negative, okay? So does that make your family worthwhile or worthless? Well, the question is, depends on what you do with your family. And you know, so the problem with nihilism, as far as I can tell, is that the nihilist presumes that the finitude that we perceive invalidates the utility of being. It's like, well, that's pretty arrogant, you might say. You might, you might say that judging the whole world in that light, which is what that comedian just did on that TV show when he laid into God, I can't remember his name, blaming him for bone cancer in children, for example, which really does suck, you know. So the, the point is, is that one of the things that we find meaningful and we could find meaningful and that's reliable is let's leave the damn question aside about the ultimate meaning of reality in its corrupt form, which is now, and try to fix the damn thing. Really try to fix it. And then see what happens, because it's clear that we can make things better, and it's bloody clear that we can make things worse. So you might ask, okay, well, if you organized your little value hierarchy underneath the proposition that it's up to you to work to bring the kingdom of God to life instead of hell, then maybe the whole problem of the negative meaning of life would go away. It's like, you never know. It beats the alternative, which is to damn the whole thing to perdition which we really tried to hard, do, hard to do in the 20th century with a fair bit of success. Or, you know, just to think, oh, well, this is meaningless and useless and I don't have any responsibility and there's no such thing as meaning. And, you know, it's like, sure, walk down that road, man. See where you go. <laughs> um, 
Okay. It seems the um, both of you agree that there's this lower level meaning system that we have, which is almost like a moment to moment perceptual system where we know how to interact with things. And both of you disagree, both of you agree that there's no higher level, the meaning of life. But in alluding to the meaning crisis and just general morality, you seem to assume that we can somehow cobble this ability to know how to interact with the glass to somehow interact with societies. So how do you think we're well, able to do this? Um, first of all, um, uh, I have to be careful. I, when I said there's no uh, ultimate meaning, and like I said, I, I, was, I was also not saying that that means that there's no ultimate meaning. Because if you say a problem is, is poor, poorly formed, you're, you're rejecting both the positive and the negative answer to that question. It doesn't imply that, therefore, the ultimate meaning is that there's no meaning. It's like saying, what's north of the North Pole? The answer is not anything. It's to reject the question. So I, I first want to challenge that, that move you made. Um, secondly, I, I do think that uh, I want to rep uh, I, I, I do think that what I'm, I'm trying to argue for, and I think Jordan is, but I'm not clear because he said about 17,000 things in his last thing. And I, want to, <laughs> I, want to, I want to try and reply to them. Um, um, <laughs> Um, I'll I, spit them out, you sort of. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm arguing for a deep continuity between those lower level processes and the highest levels. And I, I mean, and, and I think Nietzsche tried to foreshadow that. And this is again what I mean about the, Nietzsche said the height of my spirituality reaches into the depth of my sexuality, right? Mm -hmm. To try and find, and he was using both of those in, 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 a, in, a, in a metaphorical extension. I'm not only arguing for the lower level. It's a pretty good statement for a virgin too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> sorry, sorry. He was referring to Nietzsche, by the way, not me. <laughs> Um, <laughs> so I'm arguing for what I think is a very important thesis, which is a deep continuity between the lower level and for just speaking of it metaphorically, the higher level. I do think there is an important issue in, in which uh, we can talk about that higher level as distinct from the lower level of just trying to solve our daily problems, which I think is important. Namely, and that's something that you referenced, Jordan, we face a perennial problem uh, of our self-consciousness. And the problem with our self-consciousness is it means we have this enormous capacity to take a perspective on our own ability to take perspectives. I mean, one of the things about being a conscious being, and this is what I mean about a salience landscape, is we not only know facts, like propositions, and we know how to do things, we also have perspectival knowing. This is work I did with Leo Ferraro. We know what it is like to be a certain thing, to take a certain perspective to take a certain stance on the world. I know what it's like to be a father. I know what it's like to be a teacher. And that perspectival knowing of knowing what it's, to, what it's like to be something is, again, this atmospheric meaning. But the thing we can do is we can take a perspective on that lower order perspective. We can stand back and say, what does that perspective look like? Let me explain, give you an example. Right now I'm thirsty and so I have a, a thirsting perspective on the world. Things that are watery are salient to me. Things that might contain water. And you're getting thirsty right now too, right? <laughs> right? Become salient to me. But I can step back. And this was something also discovered like in India, right, by the Buddhists, right, and, and, the, and the Hindus. I can step back and take a look at my, pers my thirsting perspective. I can say, what's it like to be a thirsty person? And now I'm no longer thirsting because I'm now motivated by something different than my thirst. I'm motivated by my curiosity about my lower order thirst. And then I can step back and say, gee, what's it like to be curious? And then I can step back and wonder, what's it like to be somebody asking, what's it like to be curious? And then, then you could step back and say, what's it like watching someone listen to someone talk about being right. curious about it? Exactly, <laughs> and the point I'm trying to make the point I'm trying to make, right, is what happens is we have the capacity to very quickly move ourselves to what Nagel calls the view from nowhere, to this, you know, this bird's eye or God's eye perspective on all of reality in which we, by these recursive asking of questions, we have become deeply disengaged from our involvement with the world. We have an enormous capacity, our very capacity for self-transcendence, and I think this was also one of Nietzsche's insights, although I think Nishitani called him excellently to question on it. 
Our capacity for self-transcendence, our ability to rise above ourself, is also the very same thing that can cause us to fall into despair and absurdity. Because we can empty the world of all that involved meaning by our, uh, by our capacity to transcend ourselves to such a degree that we are overlooking it all and saying, there's nothing behind all of this. Let, let, me, let me jump in for like five seconds here. Okay, so I, I have a proposition that, that goes along with this. You guys can think about this. So, and, it, and I think it's one of the advantages of, of contemplating the notion that meaning might be an actual phenomena in and of itself. So I would say, you might say, well, when should you stop recursing? You know, which is, what's the right level of analysis? Because I could say, who cares about this damn talk? The sun is going to envelop the earth in four billion years. It's like, you know, because that's like the ultimate meaninglessness of everything. And my answer to that is, that's a stupid place to stand. And the evidence for that is, you think about it this way, is that if, if your capacity to experience the kind of meaning that imbues your life with, 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 with forward motion and with faith and, and with joy and with gratitude, imagine that that's actually a function that you have psychologically. And then imagine that that function kicks in when you're looking at things from the right perspective. And so you might say, well, is this talk important? It's like, well, it's important to me right now. It seems to be important to you guys. It has some potential importance tomorrow and next week. There's all meaning there. Is it important from the perspective of the age of the cosmos? Well, probably, but probably. <laughs> Perhaps not. And so then I would say, well, what does that do to my sense of engagement with the issues at hand? It undermines them and I fall into a pit of meaninglessness. And so then I would say, well, hey, let's not fall into that pit. Let's pick a level of analysis for the problem at hand that most richly imbues it with a sense of meaning. And then let's assume that that's part of the mechanism that calibrates our soul, so to speak, and pay attention to that. And so, because I tell my students this all the time. Wander around and notice what's meaningful to you. Just notice it. It happens. It's not, you know, you can participate in it. You're absolutely right about that. But it happens. Okay, try to stay where meaning is optimized. And then I also mentioned to them, briefly, that that's kind of what the Taoist symbol is about, right? Because the Taoist symbol is predicated on the idea, in, in a sense, that the world is made out of disorder, chaos, and order. And that there's a balance between those two things. And that if you stand on the border between order and chaos so that things are structured properly but you're still a little uncertain and curious, then that's a richly meaningful place from a phenomenological perspective. And it's like, that's the right place to stand. How do you know? Because you want to be alive despite the fact that you're suffering. It's like, hey, there's some evidence. You can't get there though without, you know, the initial presupposition that there's something deeply real about meaning. And, I think real is life-sustaining. That's part of what real is. That's a Nietzschean idea, too. Okay, well, let, let me respond to that. Uh, I want to push back on you on that a bit, because I think that's not being fair to Nagel's argument, because the point Nagel was trying to make is, it, you know, you said that's a stupid place to stand. It depends on what you're trying to achieve, right? If you're trying to do science and you're trying to reduce the, self, the way we self-deceptively project bias onto the world, then you progressively move to these higher views because every time you, I mean, that is what we do. That is how we try to reduce bias. I mean, when I can take a, pers the reason I, it's good for me to take a perspective on my lower order perspective is it helps me to determine bias and distortion in this perspective. So if I want to remove bias and distortion, if I want to get at reality and truth, and let's assume we have that platonic drive, then that feeds into this drive to go higher and higher and higher and higher, because as I go higher and higher and higher, I am removing distortion, I am removing illusion. Well, so I, I, that seems to me to be, that, that's partly why I'm a pragmatist, fundamentally. And it's because you, you're, you're, you're right about that. Is but yeah, but pragmatism is parasitic on an independent notion of truth. You have to be able to know, independent of its usefulness, that something is useful. You have to have yeah. some way of saying, I know that it's true that this is useful that my perception of its usefulness is not itself distorted. I okay, mean, I, I'm not disagreeing with that at all. Right, so I, that, I, that, I, I, th I think that what you, correct me if I'm wrong. Okay. It, you, you basically, you seem to be making an argument that goes something like this, is that there are different lenses and different levels of resolution for different tasks. That's right. And I agree with that, and absolutely. I'm, and I'm all, but I'm also making the argument that 
that the drive towards the view from nowhere has just, a deep, just as deep a purchase on us. That platonic quest to get at the, you know, the undistorted... Right. But we, distorted. Shouldn't be, we shouldn't be assuming that nowhere is the ultimate stance. It's like it has its zone of relevance, you know, and you've laid that out quite nicely. That's exactly but, what I'm saying. What I, but what I'm trying to say is, right, just to say to someone, like, don't go, don't go as far as you can because, you know, you, you might fall into absurdity is, it, to, it, 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 to, to me, sounds like, you know, well, give in to, you know, self-deception because that will be comforting. No, no I think sometimes it's just, I guess this is partly my... my experience as a clinician speaking as well. Okay. You know, because sometimes people get overwhelmed by absurdity. They don't go there, right? You know what I mean? It's not the right place for them to be. But, but I would I, also say that you shouldn't pick problems that are bigger than the ones that you can solve. I you disagree know, with you on well, that. We, we got to clarify that because I don't think that you're... I, I mean, we're doing that right now. I know. <laughs> I know. I know. I know. I know. But we're also not claiming to have the answer. But that, but that the value, as I said from the beginning, isn't in the answer but in the self-transcendent transformation of the questioner. And what I, what I, what I, was, trying to, what I was trying to say, right, is that, yes, I agree that, right, you, you, it, I don't think absurdity is caused by the, the fact that you're at the, the highest level. I mean, again, that's not Nagel's point. Absurdity is caused by the fact that we can find a clash between any two levels we pick. He gives this example. Okay, okay. Okay, so he gives this example, and please understand this, because we're older than you. There was a time, <laughs> there was a time when people's phones were in specific locations. <laughs> and in, if somebody called you, you were often not with your phone, and so you had to have a recording device to pick up the messages. I know, we had just discovered fire, but that's what it was like. <laughs> so he gives the example from that time, because he wrote the article in the early 80s. And so there's this individual, he calls up, and, they're like, and he picks up, the, he hears a pickup, and he says, he's been all prepared, he says, Susan, just don't talk, I've got to tell you this, I've got to get it out, I love you, I've loved you for a long time, it's really, and then he hears, beep, no, Susan's not here right now, please leave a message. <laughs> and you're laughing. Because humor is also about this juxtaposition of perspectives. And what's happened is that act that seems so meaningful from one's perspective is completely inconsistent with the machine's perspective, the machine of the, re the recording machine. It's the clash between perspectives, not a particular per per perspective per se, that I think is what the experience of absurdity is. It, it could be and. But, but it might be or. Well, I, I, I think, no, because uh, here's why I would challenge okay, you. Okay, okay. Uh, because I, I, would, I, I would put Spinoza against Nietzsche. Spinoza advocating, advocated going to that highest view and then found a way to reconcile it with the lowest perspective, the engaged perspective, and he said that was the blessed life. Okay, so okay. he argued that the, oh, I mean, I think that's why the ethics is a great book that deserves to be read in contrast to Nietzsche, right? Mm -hmm. Is he argued that there is, a wa there is a way to reconcile those two perspectives. He called it scientia intuitiva. And it's the reconciliation of those two perspectives that alleviates absurdity, not the preclusion of going to one or okay. the remaining in fixed in the other. And I think that that's, that's, very, in a very, that's very similar in some profoundly important ways. There's important okay. historical differences to what Buddhism is trying to advocate. That, that Buddhism is, 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 is about, you know, in meditative practice, we, we practice sort of going deeply immersive, and in contemplative practice, we go deeply out, and then the point in, in Buddhism is that those are supposed to become eventually completely interpenetrating, so that yep. the absurdity that's caused by the clash between perspectives is removed. I think the fault, as you said earlier, is not in any perspective, but in the self-consciousness that pits perspectives against each other. Good. That's very nice. That's very nice. I mean, I think that's a very elegant argument. You know, you. And I, 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 I take no issue with it. Okay. I want to take that line of reasoning in a different direction. Okay. okay we'll, fair enough. we'll play that, that same line of logic in another way. Okay. Okay. So, Victor was asking earlier, and it, it's a level of resolution perspective again. It's like, okay, well, this is really great. It's the meaning of the glass. It's like, well, yeah, what does that have to do with the meaning of life? Okay, I think the person who answered that best actually was Piaget. And let me tell you a little bit about Piaget, because the first thing, about, he was a famous child developmental psychologist, by the way, the most famous of the 20th century. And um, he was actually trying to solve the 
conflict between religion and science. You never hear that about Piaget, but he had messianic experiences when he was a young man, and he wrote a novel about it, and he wanted to reconcile religion and science. And, you know, he actually did a pretty damn good job. So, okay, so here's, here's the issue, and, and you can think about it this way. So this is how a baby builds himself or herself up. Okay, so learn to move finger, learn to move hand, learn to move hand and arms, learn to move body, hand, arms, legs, and feet, learn to orient head. Okay, learn to use integrated body to, to undertake independent tasks, okay? Then, learn to use integrated body that can undertake independent tasks in concert with another integrated body that can undertake specific tasks. You do that when you play a game. The game is, we'll say the game is, uh, we're two little girls having tea, okay? So what's the goal? The goal is that we learn how to be uh, mutually respectful while we're sharing nourishment, which is a big deal, by the way. It's something humans are unbelievably good at. It's extremely sophisticated. We're very social eaters, so if we're not eating socially, we're fat or anorexic. You know, we, we, we have to eat socially to regulate our own behavior because we're social eaters. And so we're learning how to play the game of sharing food. And, but the game has other rules than that. It's like we're learning how to play the game of sharing food in a way so that we're playing the game, so that we want the game to continue, okay? So that's an important point. And then if we get more sophisticated, then we say we're learning to play the game so that it's enjoyable for a larger number of people in a larger number of situations across larger spans of time. And so that's a hierarchical organization of fundamental abilities into, into solutions that have generalizability across more and more contexts. Now, Piaget built that way up, like, and, and he said, this is, this is associated with this idea of levels, too. Mm -hmm. Piaget believed, and, and this, is like, this is his scientific justification for emergent morality in some sense, is that, but it's within a Darwinian framework, again, not within a Newtonian framework. So, Piaget had a proposition, and the proposition was this. Um, you're, you're the bully at the moment. Victor and I are having tea. And you want us to play a different game. You want us to play, I don't know, what, what do you want us to play? Pull the cat's tail. You're a bully after all. <laughs> and so we don't want to play pull the cat's tail. And so what do you have to do? Well, you have to expend a lot of time and energy enforcing the game. And the reason you have to do that is because we don't want to play the damn game, so we're going to do everything we can to subvert. stop you, to subvert yeah. it. And so what that means is that you're gonna, and we're going to expend a tremendous amount of energy in a pursuit where we could have picked a pursuit where there was virtually no energy spent or resources. Mm -hmm. So Piaget's idea was that an equilibrated game, which is a game that everyone will play voluntarily, if you pit that in an open competition, we could say a Darwinian competition, against a disequilibrated game that requires force to maintain your basic totalitarian state, if you pit those in a one-to-one -one competition, or your totalitarian personality, if you pit them in a one-to-one -one competition in relationship to the attainment of virtually any goal across multiple contexts, the equilibrated game will win. And that's why it's better. And there's other reasons too. It's better because it isn't only a solution to a problem that's posed in one place. It's, it's a meta-solution to a meta-problem that's posed in many places. And I'll just give one example of no, this. No, keep going. This is good. Okay. So, you all tell your kids, be a good sport. And your kids, being intelligent kids, think, well, well don't we want to win this game? It's like, of course you want to win the game. Okay, so why can't I bash the guy next to me over the head with my hockey stick as long as I don't get caught? That's a Canadian example, right? <laughs> So I'll tell you a story. I went to this hockey game once, and my son was playing, and th that was really fun. And he was in a, like the final game, and uh, there was a kid on his team who was, ex he was a great hockey player, very, very good hockey player. But um, it was all him, eh? He had the puck, he wouldn't pass, and he was pretty good at scoring and so on, but he wasn't playing with the team, and he was playing to win. It was fine, fine, fine. Um, so my, my son's team lost. It was a great game. I think it was like four to three at the end, and they, the other team scored in the last 30 seconds or whatever, and then all the kids came off the ice, and the parent of this one kid, who's like the little hero hockey player, comes up to him, and the kid had like smashed his stick against the cement, and he was all you know, running around and cursing the 
referees and and the father came running up to him and said you were robbed you know you absolutely should have won that and I thought you're such an idiot and, and he was he was truly an idiot and and a pathological one at that and and he was really destroying his child's soul and and here's this is not funny it's true that is what he was doing I saw it happen over a long span of time that was just a microcosm of their relationship and his attitude towards the world now why was that wrong it's like the kid wanted to win it's like yay go man wait win he was a really good hockey player so what was wrong with what the father did? Okay, so then we step back and we say, it's not important whether you win or lose, it's how you play the game. So what does that mean? Well, it doesn't actually mean what it says because it actually is important whether you win or lose. You should be trying to win. But then the question is, what are you trying to win? Now, and then, the, then that gets complicated. It's like, well, you're trying to win being the best hockey player on your team? Are you trying to win that hockey game? Or are you trying to win the opportunity to be invited to play as many games as you can possibly play with as many people in as many contexts as you possibly can across the entire course of your life? Okay, that's what winning means. And so the rule is, don't win the local and proximal event at the price of being in a player in the multitude of iterable games. That's the moral principle, you know, don't put the cart before the horse, so to speak. And so, and the reason for that is that a game is a microcosm of life, that's a Piagetian idea, which is why, by the way, we like games and we'll watch them and we're thrilled about them and we engage in them all the time. But the game isn't the issue. The issue, in some sense, is the set of all possible games. And the most moral action is the action that will enable you to have the highest probability of winning the set of all possible games. And it's even a little more complicated than that, which is you have to be a player in the set of all possible games in a manner that supports the existence of as many games as possible. And that's, and so you see what I mean, and human beings can do that because we can go up that damn chain of abstraction, right? Mm -hmm. We don't have to just concentrate on this. Or, or a game of, of, of let's make tea, you know, we can play these meta games and pose these meta questions. And one of Piaget's claims was, um, don't kid yourself about this, there are rules. There are rules. There are rules for games, there's lots that aren't playable. One rule for a sustainable game is everybody wants to play. Now another rule is that some people get to try to win, you know. So, but obviously that's not where the abstraction level tops out. And so I love that. It's like, oh, that's so cool. It's, there's a hierarchy of moral value because that's action orientation. And it's an emergent property of the way that complex systems organize themselves. They're basically dominance hierarchies, by the way. And not only that, that system of organization has been around for so long, and I think it's about 400 million years, that we're actually biologically adapted to that structure. Because we know that there are dominance hierarchies that can sustain themselves quite nicely across time. And those usually value the individual and the relationship between the individual and society. And there's those that don't. And we're really adapted to the ones that do because those are the ones in which we live when we live. And so this is deeply biological and it's also emergent at the same time. So it's a testament to your notion that it, it is necessary to be able to reconcile the local view mm -hmm. with the ultimate view. And the more you can ensure that those levels aren't in conflict with one another, that's exactly what a Piagetian equilibrated state is, is that a union has been attained across the multiple levels of hierarchical organization. That's, um... Take that. <laughs> I, I will take it. You know that I, uh, I've always liked this argument yep. of yours. I yep. think it's one of your best. And, um which is not a left-handed insult of your other arguments. <laughs> um, I, I, I really like this argument. I think it, it's a good one. And I've, I've thought about it, and I want to share some thoughts I have about it with you. I thought, I, I think that, uh, and this is to allude back to Spinoza again in contrast to Nietzsche, um, I think, and again, this is the platonic insight. I mean, because Plato, of course, had a, a, a metaphor also for this moving up the levels. It's the, it's the metaphor of coming out of the cave into the, into the real world. And I, I think what I want to say is the highest level of the metagame is the game, because games are, again, things that exist between us and the world, right? Um, I think the highest level of the metagame is, is the game of intelligibility. 
I mean, I think, I think what we have to have ultimately, and this is what Habermas was on about, right? You have to have shareable intelligibility to do, that's the, that's the highest thing. We have to constantly uh, be committed to that, that, that there's a, that the, that the grounding normativity of all of our moral normativities is actually this, norma, this normative demand, make things intelligible. And I think- So do you think, do you think about that like as a precondition for the, for the emergence of cooperative games? Yes. So it's like getting the rules straight. Exa getting, the, getting the language by which you can formulate the rules straight. Yeah. And, and using language in a very extended metaphor. And, mm -hmm. and so I think, to, I think part of the issue for us though as human beings is, is that we do have this drive to you know, get at what is try to, you know, mac to, to get the maximal intelligibility project. And I think science tries to do that in some ways. Mm -hmm. But the, the problem is that we then, and, and let me talk for a couple minutes on this. We, we, hit a, we hit a kind of perennial problem. We have these two different notions vis-a-vis -vis intelligibility about what realness is. And I, I thought, I wanted to ask you about this because I, I want to know if this lines up with your chaos order thing. Mm -hmm. We have one notion of realness that what, what, to say that something is real is to say that it, 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 has, it is coherent, it is, confir it is con confirmed, it is coherent. Mm -hmm. Things have come together, right? And, 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 and there's this mutual fittedness. And then we also have a notion that, no, what's real is what catches us by surprise, mm -hmm. what, what was outside of our system, and that what, what, what we didn't know Right, and, and that's when we get yeah. at reality. So we have these yeah. two notions of realness. And I think th th we have two for a very good reason, by the way. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we actually have three. Well, okay, so, well, so we'll, we'll let me, let but me I, those are two of them for sure. Okay, okay. Uh, so I think what we have is we do have this, we have this c confirmation notion, and then we have this, we have this surprise notion. And science, mm -hmm. science tries to pit the two against each other, right? So what you try to do is you try and do the theory part, which is all the confirming coherence part, and then you run experiments in which the world can make, make basically make you go, oh shit, right? And then you got to, oh, right? And, and so you- At the level you want it to. Generally. Yes, of course. You, 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 you don't want to burn down your lab. Or you don't want to horrify yourself like, oh my God, flowers can talk or something yeah. like that. Um, <laughs> right. Yeah, too much chemistry there. <laughs> right. <laughs> and, and, and so part, part of the problem though and, uh, is that although science in one sense tended to try to, uh, Science is largely, to some degree, a psychotechnology of trying to integrate those two together so that they work coherently for us, but also surprisingly for us. Part of the problem, though, is when Descartes, and I guess I'll put Descartes before the horse here, um, <laughs> is what... Is that Nietzsche's horse? Yeah. <laughs> is you, you were talking about putting the cart before the horse. I, I was like, Nietzsche, uh, I, sorry, Descartes, Descartes did something, he, he really exacerbated those two, and he put a chasm between them. He said, look, what's real is, you know, is sort of what's externally measurable by mathematics. So the mathematical properties are the real properties, and all the subjective ones are just in my head. But then he said this opposite thing. He said, you know what's most real? My mind, mm -hmm. and how it touches itself. And this is completely inexplicable. It's just this direct contact thing. So, and then what he said is, right, those are, he didn't ever try to reconcile them. And so what, what we've done in the West is we careen between these two different senses of realness. We careen between real is the mathematical out there-ness. No, no, real is the subjective in here-ness. And you can always pit one against a, off again because this could all be a dream, mm -hmm. right? But, oh, no, no, you're if just If it was crazy. a dream, you'd be naked. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I'm a naked bully. Okay, so. Yeah. Um, so, but of course, then we do the opposite and say, oh no, that's just an illusion. You're just dreaming. And we do the opposite <clears> thing. <throat> and, and so what I'm suggesting has, has happened is our attempts to, um, our attempts to uh, ground or get a clear purchase on the metagame are, are exacerbated by the perennial problem that we have these two conflicting notions of realness, yeah. right? Yeah. And then the historical problem that Descartes basically put this chasm between these two, di di these two different notions. He created you know, Cartesian dualism. Yeah. There's these two worlds, there's the subjective world and the objective world. They share no properties. There's no way to reconcile. And what we do is we constantly there, we constantly undermine. Our, our notion of realness is rendered permanently unstable. And so I'm not, I'm not at all challenging your argument. No, no, you no, understand no. that. What I I'm feel saying, like you've just like 
tossed me a pumpkin in slow motion so I can bat it out of the park. <laughs> okay, well, d let me just finish and then I'll, I'll, let, I'll let you hit the pumpkin. Um, so, so, so once again, what I'm trying to indicate is, I think you're right. I think, I think, I think it deeply matters to us to reconcile the meta game, and the highest meta game I think is the realness game, against the lower game. And, 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 and I think that is the grounding of our, our moral drive. I think that is deeply right. Now what I'm suggesting to you is there is a perennial problem given our sort of fundamental epistemic machinery that undermines our sense of realness, and that is interacting with a historical factor uh, Descartes' separation of the two worlds, and those are now reinforcing each other in a vicious way in our time, so that we can't get a stable enough notion of realness so that we can bring about the very reconciliation that you say we long for and we need, and that's part and parcel about what I mean when I say we're in a meaning crisis. It's great, that's great, that's, yeah, the other one, I think. So, okay, so, you know, there's this, there's this brand of psychological thinking that's basically based in Freud via a guy named Ernest Becker who wrote a book called The Denial of Death in the 1970s and it won a Pulitzer Prize. It's a pretty good book. And it takes Freud's idea that um, religion is a defense against death anxiety um, and it, it develops that in a very intelligent and comprehensive manner. So Becker was trying to update Freudian psychoanalytic theory and kind of have the last word on it. And I really think he did that. It's a brilliant book, but it's, it's really wrong. But it's wrong in a great way, which is something to say about a book, you know? Yeah. So... I'd like to be wrong like that. Yeah, it'd be great <laughs> to be wrong like that in some important way. Yeah, absolutely. So, first of all, religion, one of religion's diverse and multitude, mu multitudinous functions is that it provides some... Uh, security against the anxiety of death. It's not the reason for it. It's like you got to beware of people who ever say that one thing is the reason for, you know, that's an ideologue, right? It's like, well, it's all econ economics. It's all sex. It's all fear. It's like, no, it's not. That's not right. And it's simple-minded and it's wrong. So, 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 you know, that's a flaw to some degree in Freudian thinking, although he was very smart. He knew about aggression and all sorts of other things. Anyways, back to Becker. So there's this idea that our meaning systems, that's the internal structure we use to organize the chaos of the world, protect us from the anxiety of death. And then, so that's one form of meaning for Becker. And which modern is, mor mortality salience. Theory yeah, it's the same thing. It's, it's, yeah. That's Becker's, that's Becker's, yeah. it's an elaboration of Becker. It doesn't really have much to add to Becker, actually. Right. So, um, so, so there's something that's right about that because we do use our belief systems to defend ourselves. But we should be very clear about this. Okay, first of all, culture is not a belief system. I agree. The with representation that. of culture is a belief system. Mm -hmm. That is not the same thing. Culture is what's keeping the electricity on. Okay, and that's not defending us against death anxiety, although it is. It's actually defending us against death, which is much better, right? Because we're not sitting outside freezing to death. Right, and that's, there's nothing psychological about that. It's like, there are the lights, it's warm, the floor isn't moving, John isn't attacking me. And, you know, <laughs> no, seriously, it's like, <laughs> right. That's not belief, man, that's that he's not attacking me. And so, we represent that belief, and that also makes it somewhat pliable and manipulable and fragile, because we can also undermine it, but Culture protects us from death, and the representation of culture protects us sometimes from death anxiety. Okay, so, now, Becker also pointed out that there was something else that seemed to give life meaning, and that was associated with the Cartesian notion of consciousness. So he thought that people were, um, apart from being protected from terror, which we needed to be, we also needed to convince ourselves that our lives were worthwhile. And we basically did that by deluding ourselves that we were engaged in some sort of heroic project. And somehow we could deceive ourselves well enough about the importance of that, through self-deception mostly, that that also added another layer of meaning to our life. Okay. The problem with Becker, fundamentally, was that he didn't read Jung. And he said right in the introduction to his book, I've never had any patience for Jung, and I never thought he said anything to say about in his books on alchemy. And that was really too bad, because if he would have read them, he would have got the book right instead of wrong. So, so imagine this way instead. So I wrote a paper a while back called Three Kinds of Meaning. Okay, so the one meaning is the meaning that announces itself when something that you don't want to have happen happens. 
it's not exactly what you don't, it's not what you don't predict. Because we don't predict, we want. Now, part of wanting is predicting. Mm -hmm. But if you think about it as predicting, you don't take into account motivation. It's a huge mistake. We're not like cold cognitive expectations. No, I agree with that. Okay, so sometimes things don't turn out the way we want. That's meaningful. Sometimes the meaning is kind of cool. It's like, you know, you make a joke and I didn't expect it. It's like, ha ha, and I laugh because I can transcend the unexpected and that's delight in my own capacity for conscious creation, you know? So that feels really good. And I like the joke because of that. So, and that's not an illusion, by the way. It's not self-deception. I did transcend the conceptual structure momentarily with you and it's like, good yeah. for us, you know? <laughs> so, it's not an illusion. Okay, but now and then something goes unexpected in a way, undesired in a way you don't like. So, for example, you find out that your wife has had like six affairs in the last three months and that she's never been faithful to you at all in the last 20 years. It's like, that's rough, man. Especially if you liked her, you know? <laughs> yeah, well, you know, if you didn't like her, it might be good news, but... but and I, I'm actually serious about that, too. But, okay, so you think, well, how upsetting should that be? It's hard for your nervous system ca to calibrate that, but here's, here's a rough mode of understanding the calibration. The existence of your of faithfulness in your spouse is an axiomatic precondition for a set of models that you erect about how the world will lay itself out if you, in a way that you want to. Which is to say, you've modeled the future with this person, it's a future you want, and then if she's not there, or if her, if her faithfulness is absent, that collapses. And what does it collapse into? Well, it collapses into the unstructured void, fundamentally. And that's really hard on you. If, if you're betrayed like that, and this is why betrayers occupy the lowest circle of hell, right? If you're betrayed like that, it's even worse. Your future's gone, and that sucks because you put a lot of work into it probably, and you need to stabilize the dead <coughs> thing because it's rife with uncertainty. But then your present is gone too because, you know, who the hell is this person you're living with? And more to the point, what kind of moron are you? You know, and so that means your model of the most important person in your life is gone, collapses into the void, and you have no idea what the hell's up with you either. How could you be so blind? How could you be so naive? How could you be so foolish? How could you be so gullible? You know, how evil is this person? How evil are you? How did you, did you, uh, did you instigate this in some unconscious manner? Were you looking for punishment all along? And then there's the whole problem of your past. It's like, whatever you thought it was, it isn't. It's something completely different. You didn't know who you were with when you were doing all the things that you thought you were doing. So that's a collapse. If you think about this game hierarchy we talked about, eh? The, the stable marriage part of a game hierarchy is way the hell up the abstraction level, right? And so uh, it, it, it decomposes into a very large subset of operations and perceptions. Mm -hmm. And when you blow that, you basically blow out a huge chunk of the personality. And then what, what shines through that is the void, essentially. It's terror, it's, 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 it's depression. It's, and it's not just psychological, right? Because you actually don't know where you are, who you're with anymore, and so the way your body responds to that is by assuming that you've been dropped naked into a pit of lions, right? And really, your cortisol levels go way up, your heart rate goes, it's like you're in a state of chronic, chronic, horrible stress, physiological stress, and that will kill you. It's not just psychological. It hurts your brain, it hurts your immune system makes you diabetic, it makes you obese, it's, you name it. It's like cortisol's bad news. So your body is estimating the proportion of the territory that you inhabit that has now become uninhabitable, right? And so there's a, that's the meaning of chaos. That's the meaning of chaos, and it's an a priori meaning. And a lot of it is you should be frozen in terror like you're looking at the Gorgon's face. And the other part of it is, how, wait a minute. There's, there's a little treasure there, too. It's like the dragon with the treasure. Maybe you can stop living a false life, right? You can put yourself back together. You can start living in truth. You can find a relationship that's actually genuine. And so that's like the, that is precisely the, the treasure that the dragon guards. That's why we have that story, by the way. And that's also why it's the oldest human story that we know. So I suspect it, it traces itself all the way back to the time 60 million years ago when we were throwing branches at snakes. So it's old, that story. It wasn't a story then, right? It was a pattern of behavior. So there's the meaning of chaos, 
And then there's the meaning of order. And the meaning of order is the regulation of chaos just so that the meaning that's useful shines through. Right? And this is sort of an, the kind of idea that Huxley had about consciousness as a reducing valve. I think that sure. was Berkeley too, right? Was it Berkeley? Uh, no, Berkeley has a different idea. Okay, okay. Prebham had the same idea. Though. Okay, okay. So, so that's two meanings. Meaning of order, stable, security. It can tilt towards tyranny if it gets too much. And then there's the meaning of chaos, which can be horrifying at high levels of abstraction and interesting at lower levels. And then there's one other meaning, which is the third class. And the third class is the meaning that you experience when you're mediating between order and chaos. And that's the, that's the heroic meaning. It's like you're, you've got one foot in order, so maybe you've got your scientific theory, and you know you're out on the, the edge of that. You're on the frontier, the scientific frontier and you're poking your beak out into the unknown. And as you're doing that, you're seeing new patterns and you're, you're incorporating them and you're dissolving and reconstituting the whole structure of the known that, that is ordered. And that's, that's meaningful delight. That's when you're doing that, you know you're in the right place. And you say, well, what's the meaning of life? It's that's, we have three. There's the meaning of chaos, look out, it's promise and catastrophe. We have the meaning of order, that's security and tyranny, and then we have the meaning of exploration, and that's the hero myth. And it's not a false thing, it's not self-deception, it's like you're out there transforming chaos into order, and that's habitable territory for you and everyone else. It's like, otherwise it's bloody freezing to death and chewing on bones with the dogs, you know? It's like, we don't want to do that. So, it's not, it's not non-real, and we also don't know how far we can push it. Like if all of you stayed properly on the border between it, order and chaos and were attempting to rectify in your environment everything you could in a meaningful way, it's like God only knows how much better you could make the world. And like I would say that's a, that there's an ultimateness about that. And the ancient Egyptians had figured this out a very long time ago and it, it was partly for that reason that they worshipped a god called Horus who is the eye. Everybody knows the Egyptian eye. And both the Egyptians and the Mesopotamians had figured out that the fundamental attribute of the heroic spirit isn't rationality. It's the capacity to pay attention. And what, what's so cool about that, that's the Cartesian issue, right? Consciousness is the capacity to pay attention. And attention looks beyond the pyramid of the known. It's the little eye at the top. It's looking beyond, and it's extending the pyramid, and it's transforming the pyramid when it needs to be transformed, and everybody can stay safely and nicely ensconced inside of that, and, and it stays dynamic. So that's really the redemptive meaning, I think, because you can't be secure. You can't. You're too fragile, and things are too complicated, so you can't put your faith in ultimate security. That's what totalitarians do, and that doesn't work. It just turns genocidal. So what can you put your faith in? Well, you can put your faith, and it's not even faith, it's an observable phenomena. Concentrate on doing things that are meaningful, that you can do. They'll announce themselves to you, it's like you have a, something's bugging you, it's like fix it, you'll find that that's quite meaningful. So, and that meaning redeems you right in that moment, because if it's meaningful enough, you're not self-conscious and anxious and hurt and suffering and devastated. You're like on top of the game. And so then you might say, well, what if you just stayed there all the time? Well, then problem solved. So, and you might say, well, no, it's like, that's fine, say it. But you could try it. That's the thing that's so cool about this. It's actually a, this is kind of an existential argument in some sense. It's like, you can run the experiment. I tell my students all the time. Watch your life, see what you're doing that's really low quality and meaningless that you could just stop doing. So you don't have to answer ultimate questions to do that. It's like, it's not what is truth, it's what is falsehood. And it's way easier to figure out what falsehood is than truth. So if you're doing stupid moronic things that hurt you and your family and you know it, and you could stop, and you think you might stop, which is quite a set of constraints, right? Then stop! <laughs> And then see what happens. And the first thing that'll happen is that things will tilt a bit. A little less chaos, a little more order, a little more freedom from you, for you. You know, sometimes it's the opposite. It's like you've got your family around the neck. It's like, don't do anything I don't want you to do. It's like tyrant, you know? So then the trick is to loosen up the old tyrant a bit and get a little more chaos in there. 
and that'll optimize the meaning again. And so you said right at the beginning of the discussion that meaning wasn't a proposition. That's right. right? And I would say, well, one form of meaning is propositional. That's the orderly meaning. Mm -hmm. But the transcendent form of meaning, upon which even order depends, is the dynamic meaning making. But that's what I meant. Yeah, I know, I know, I understand that. Uh, that's, what I, that's what I was trying to convey with this notion that I think is completely accessible to current cognitive science of our evolved, this evolving relation. I mean, because the, 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 one of the key ideas in the Darwinian model is you play, you integrate, you, you have the chaos, right? You have the, you have the opening up of the variations, often due to mutation yep, and random yep, events. Yep, yep. And then you, you have natural selection that is the ordering, that's the selection process. That's driving, and then what evolution means is exactly this, this constant interplay between them. And that's what I meant when I think cognition is not a set of beliefs in our head. It is the, it's the brain's ongoing evolved fittedness to the world. And I do think, I agree with you that um, learning to, or part of what it is to be a wise person is to learn to situate yourself in such a way that that, that relationship becomes very attuned, it becomes very self-propelling. It's, 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 um, it's, I think you, 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 you went Egyptian, but I think it's what Socrates meant when he said, you know, wisdom begins in wonder. That the point about because uh, when, we're, when, we're, when we're in a state of wonder, and, and Descartes actually, contrary to what a lot of people thought about Descartes, Descartes said we're, we're different from the other animals because we're not motivated just by fear and desire, we're motivated also by wonder, and that's what makes us unique. Because wonder is about being on that horizon of intelligibility, that moving horizon in which behind us right, is right, what has been confirmed, but what's in front of us is what has not been explored. Yes. And yes, so I do think that... That's the Taoist symbol. It's a Taoist symbol too, and yep. as you know, I, I am a Taoist, I practice Tai Chi. But I, I, I do challenge the idea, well, maybe you use the term a little bit different. I, I do challenge the idea that that is not a rational state. I think we have, too, we have reduced the notion of rationality too much to log logical argumentation. So, for example, I would say that the Buddhist notion of mindfulness, of reflecting on how we pay attention so that we make it more reliably capable of putting us on that, so that we more reliably flourish and achieve our goals, yeah. is as much a form, a, a cognitive style of rationality as good logical argumentation is. Precisely okay. because by being on, learning how to structure your attention so it reliably keeps you on the horizon, of wonder is precisely to place yourself in the optimal place for flourishing as a human being. That constitutes, I think, for me, a fundamental kind of rationality. And we're again giving into the romantic notion that there's this deep dichotomy between, you know, attention and experience and logic and rationality. And we should abandon that dichotomy and we should see that there is as much rationality, right, going on in, you know, the training of mindfulness as there is in, in you have the rationality okay. of training okay. logical okay. argumentation. So, so let, look, I, I, I appreciate what you're saying, but I want to point out... Because, well, let me just yep. say, because okay. rationing ultimately, uh, rationality ultimately comes from ratio, from rationing. It's fundamentally about the logistical distribution of your resources for success, right, as a human being. It's not primarily about the logical ordering of your inferences. That's just one way in which we ration one type of our cognitive resource. But it is not our most fundamental resource. Look, our, beh our behavior is not ultimately and primarily driven by our beliefs. Beliefs matter, they affect our behavior. But there's all this stuff outside or below our beliefs that is driving our behavior. And what gets most access to that is not our beliefs, but what we find salient, what we find relevant, to bring it back to what I was saying okay. before. Okay, so, so yes, but. Okay. And th th this is why I want to make this, this and like we're, we're circulating around the same set of ideas, but there's an important point of clarification here, I think. Okay. And so, okay. So one of the things that you probably all know is that the Catholic Church was very skeptical about rationality, right? And modern people are not very happy about that because they think of that as anti-science in a sense and the sign of a, like a, uh, what, a degenerate institution. And yeah, yeah, you can understand that. But they had a reason. And I figured out this reason when I was studying um, Paradise Lost, right? And the reason was this. So the, the book Paradise Lost came out when, it's the great poem by John Milton, came out 
roughly speaking, when the nation states in Europe were really starting to get going and when political ideologies were really st trying to, starting to structure themselves. So they were like secular belief systems. And the way I read Milton is that, so Lucifer, Satan in Milton's Paradise Lost, is he's Lucifer. So he's the highest spirit in God's heavenly hierarchy, so to speak. And he's the bringer of light, right? And Satan, like satanic arrogance is rational arrogance. Okay, so what does that mean exactly? Well, let's look at the Soviet Union, okay? What happened in the Soviet Union with the communists was that they set up a system of axioms, such as from each according to his ability, to each according to his need, which sound lovely, axiomatically true, right? So they're fundamental beliefs. And then they erected a rational system on the basis of those axiomatic beliefs that was completely coherent and closed. And then they worshiped the ability to make that absolutely coherent and not and not to, to have any necessity of stepping outside of it. In fact, if you stepped outside of it with your own suffering, instead of taking into account the fact that your suffering meant that the totalitarian viewpoint was incomplete, they just killed you. Yes. Uh, that was a lot easier than fixing the damn thing. And so what Milton intuited was that the rational spirit, which is the intelligence of human beings, the rational and propositional based intelligence that wants coherence and rigor, could be stretched to such a degree that it became a replacement for appreciation of the transcendent, which would be the thing outside the known. It just replaces that, and that's the satanic appropriation of the highest heaven in, in, in God's heavenly kingdom. You know? And Milton's prediction about that was that that turned the rational mind into something that would inevi inevitably rule over hell. Well, that's, that's what happened in the 20th century. Now, I think I don't think rationality is the right term exactly, and maybe attention isn't the right term either, although I think it's closer. I think the right term is logos, sure. and logos, of course, is the root of logic, but it's also the root of the idea, it's a Christian idea fundamentally, although it's, it's expressed in many other religious beliefs, of the creative capacity of the investigative creative spirit, right? So it's investigation. And it's the transformation of the consequence of investigation into fully articulated representation. And then it's the sharing of that. And so what we're doing right now, this is a logos conversation. Yeah, logos. Because yeah. you're not trying to impose your propositions on me. And I'm not trying to impose my propositions on you. What we're trying to do is to use the structures that we both have, the propositional structures, to dance with them. And out of the dance to produce something that's emergent and that's dynamic and that's living, it's the living spirit, actually, that's living, that's appropriate, it's, it's historically grounded and precisely appropriate to this time and place. And that's the logos. And so that's why in complex, especially in complex Western systems, although not only in them, the logos is the thing that's not only at the top of the hierarchy of value, but it's also the thing that brings order out of chaos at the beginning of time. Okay, so. okay I would agree with that. Uh, you'd be pleased to know that when I talk about this level, of the, the brain and mind in my courses, I use the term logos to, to, to label it. Um, so my students can vouch for me on that. Um, um, and I do agree, uh, but I, I would also point out that logos is also the basis of the word logistical, which again is about the distribution of resources. Um, right, 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 absolutely. Um, and, and so what I was proposing to you uh, is, is that, um, um, that a Socratic, I mean, whatever else Socrates was, I mean, he was open to the transcendent in a, a very important way. But he, under, uh, he was also, you know, a, a Nietzsche. That's why he knew that his not knowing was the most important thing he knew. But he did know, but see, people forget that although Socrates said he didn't know in that sense, he said he knew that he did not know. That doesn't mean that he was just ignorant. He meant he had, a, he had what Nicholas of Cusa called learned ignorance. He had an inside knowledge of the way in which, uh, an inside awareness of the way in which he was limited and, and, uh, and faulted. But, but Socrates did claim to know some things. He claimed to know ta erotica, he, which didn't mean he was some sort of sexual master. He, meant he, he, knew, he knew what to care about. He knew what to find significant. He knew that the unexamined life was not worth living. And he knew that to such a degree that he was willing to die for that. So there was a kind of knowing that he talked about. But again, it's this knowing about, again, what to care about, what to find relevant, what you should, what you should direct it towards. And he saw argumentation not as something antithetical to that process, but as something that could deeply support it. The Socratic process of Atlantis and argumentation was not antithetical to that 
logos, the dia logos, but right. exactly meant to be constitutive and enhancement, enhancing of that very transformation of what we fundamentally care about and what we find most significant. And I think it's been a mistake, again, due to the romantics, because most of our mistakes are due to them, right? That Don't forget the postmodernists. I, <laughs> fine. Okay. But what I'm, this, this, this putting on one side of argumentation and then putting on the other, the other side caring and emotion. I mean, what's going on in cognitive science right now is exactly, I mean, neuroscientists like Damasio, right, or, or, or Montague are saying, this is a false dichotomy that we have saddled ourselves with too long. You cannot be a rational being if you're not also a deeply emotional being, and you can't and be an, an emotional being. being if you're not a being that is in some sense doing relevance realization and rationing its resources. They are, e they are interdependent, and, e and equally interdefining. And I think that, again, ultimately goes to the fact that relevance realization is not cold calculation. It is ultimately also deeply, right, effective, arousing, it's salient. And again, this is, what it, this is what we're trying to do when we talk about the meaning in life. We're trying to find those, those ways of behaving and seeing and paying attention that are rational in the Socratic sense of affording that interrelationship between argumentation and caring that again puts us on the horizon of, abil uh, of intelligibility, puts us in that place where wonder and a flow of insight becomes the primary way into which we try to adaptively respond to a world that will always be beyond our, cognit our complete cognitive grasp. Put her there. <laughs> that was great. That's good, eh? So that seems to be a good end to the debate. I think we can, uh, we've got about 10 minutes, so it might be a good idea to uh, incorporate some of the ideas from the audience. I'd like to say one thing first. Um, um, I gave um, credit to uh, work that I do with Leo Ferraro. I also want to point out that a lot of these ideas uh, have not, I have not worked out in isolation. Uh, uh, my good friend, Chris Master Pietro right there, is a co-author of a book uh, on a lot of these issues, and he's been, uh, a co-author in a true sense, and so I want to give him credit for some of the arguments and ideas. We've often worked these out together, so I just I want to be sure. That. It seems like both of you. It seems like both of you have arrived at the conclusion that uh, a sort of uh, self-reflective disposition that adapts meaning structures dynamically while you live is how you generate proper meaning structures. I, I would like to offer you something to think about. This is like a leap way the hell up the abstraction chain. You've all seen Pinocchio, I presume, yes? How many have seen Pinocchio? Yes. You know, you know you're watching like animated drawings of some puppet rescuing his father from a whale, right? It's like, what the hell are you up to, by the way? <laughs> so you might think about that for a minute. You go into the theater and you watch that and you think, oh yeah, it's like there's a puppet and you know, he goes to an island and then he dives into the ocean with a cricket and then he finds his father in a whale. And then a fairy changes him into a boy. That all makes sense. <laughs> it's like, well, no, actually it doesn't make any sense at all. And what's even more interesting is that you actually don't care whether it makes any sense and that you'd be annoyed at anyone who would point it out. So one of the things I would like to point out is that the fundamental theme of Pinocchio is that if you don't rescue your father, which is order, by the way, from the bottom of the sea, which is chaos, then you can't become a genuine human being. And you know, we show that to our kids because we know it's true, but we're not smart enough to understand it. So true, truly, we, we act out and represent symbolically many things that we cannot articulate. And that's in fact what art is for. But you know, you might walk away from this thinking, well, you don't believe this sort of thing. It's like, no, you might think that you don't believe it. But if you watch how you act, you believe it. And the only thing you should ever do when you're trying to figure out what someone believes is watch how they act, because what they say about themselves is a very pale reflection, generally speaking, of the actuality that, that them, they themselves are. You do not comprehend yourself, obviously, because we wouldn't even need this discussion. But, well, I'll leave it at that. I just I wanted to point that out because the sorts of things that we're talking about are being broadcast at you in many ways all the time. 
and you know the themes, what, 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 what 20th and 21st century philosophy and cognitive science are trying to do when, when they're doing the deepest thing they can do, is to raise these, in, these, these, these forms of knowledge that we've acquired over, over God only knows what length of time, up from the depths and to make them articulate and to help us become real and to realize ourselves. And like, that is the solution to the problem of life insofar as there is a solution. And it may well be a sufficient solution. Socrates thought it was a sufficient solution. I agree. You know, he felt that his identification with the Logos process, roughly speaking, had given his life so much meaning and depth that when the gods offered him the chance to shuffle off the mortal coil, he went and had a little colloquy with his conscience, his daemon, which was basically Logos, and it said, good job, old man. Maybe it's, it's luck for you. You can drink the hemlock, you say goodbye to all your friends, you don't have to go through Alzheimer's and the degeneration of your being. Say an aura, and that's why Socrates went through the trial. And, you know, I mean, we still, we know that story, and we know it for a bloody reason. It's like he's at the base of our thought structures, yes. along with other people. So... Socrates means a great deal to me. <laughs> so there seems to be at least one solution to try to pursue a meaningful life. Dan Dolderman poses an interesting question, which is, how can people overcome their resistance to the crushing responsibility that comes with confronting the meaning crisis? Well, oh, that's easy. Try to comprehend the alternative. You know, you're either aiming for heaven or you're going to end up in hell, and it'll happen while you're alive. I don't have any idea what will happen afterwards, but like, you can see people in hell all the time. You just have to look around. And so you're either on the path and moving forward and upward and aiming at the right thing, or you're backsliding backwards into a place that is properly conceptualized as eternal and punishing. It's like, that's no problem. So the way you motivate yourself partly is by thinking, well, do you really want more suffering and misery in the world, or do you want less? You know, and that's basically the decision that we made at the Nuremberg trials, right? way back at the end of World War II. Is it wrong to inflict pointless pain and suffering on people for aesthetic purposes? And the answer was, well, yeah. Okay, good, we got hell specified. That's good. So you think, well, the opposite of that. Whatever's the opposite of that? Well, we don't know. That's what you're pursuing, unless you were like, pretty fond of what happened with the Nazis. You know? So you, you motivate yourself by running away from the most awful thing there is towards the thing that's the best that could possibly be. And it's up to you to decide what those things are. I mean, you're an independent being with all sorts of ability. It's like, solve the problems you can solve, like more power to you. I've got my problems, I'm going to solve them. And hopefully, jointly, all of us, we can make this place that's fragmented and flawed and decrepit and trouble and beauty and all of that into a place that's as good as we can imagine anyways. And we should adopt the responsibility to do that because the alternative, you think the, that responsibility is miserable. Is you try your responsibility and just see what happens. So that's, that's my answer to that problem. Can I have the question right again, please? Because I, I don't, I think I have a, I'm not gonna challenge what Jordan says, but I, I think I wanna answer a different aspect of Dan's question. How can people overcome the resistance to the crushing responsibility that comes with confronting right. the meaning? Right. So I crisis? think you can make a moral argument like Jordan has, and I think that's valuable. But I know Dan; he's a good friend of mine, and I think part of uh, what he was all part of what's being implied there is that um, the, the question is more about how to how to enable people. Okay. And what I what I would answer, and I hope that's a fair thing to say. Dan's nodding, so that's a good sign. Um, <laughs> Um, I, I would say there that, and, and this is again to fall back onto Socrates and, and Plato, and, and give, me a, uh, give me a moment here because I'm going to say something that might be strike a little bit at first. Plato talked about the fact that people have to be seduced into transcendence, and, and, and that word kind of strikes us odd because we don't like the, the notion of seduction, but what he meant by that is you, it's, like you can't, it's like you have to sometimes tell your kids, just do this, and then once you've done it, you will know why it was important to do it. You have to go through the transformation in order to understand why the transformation is valuable to you. Now, typically, people just know, know right? And so what you want to do is you want, you want to give some, a form of behavior to people from where, that's inside the box they're in. 
that they like to do inside the box, but has this little time bomb in it. And Jesus of Nazareth was a master at these kinds of time bombs, and they were called parables. Mm -hmm. You tell this story like, oh, I know what this story is, but it has this little explosive thing in the center of it. That's a snake. Okay, well, whatever. <laughs> and, the, and the point I'm trying to make is you give people, right, certain psychotechnologies, certain techniques, and you say, you know, this will help do this, this will help you do this, this will, this will help you know, solve you know, some of your more, more practical problems, this will make you more insightful, this will make you a little bit more cognitively flexible. But then what you've, also, what you've actually done is you've also prepared them in, uh, in two ways. You've prepared them to actually extend that machinery because it has a momentum in it and start to ask the question for themselves. And you've also enabled them to, act, to respond to the question in a more challenging form. And then if you can keep doing that with them in a kind of Socratic dance, you can, you can draw, and this is what was meant by the seduction metaphor, you can draw people into a very deep kind of responsibility without having them at any point confront a kind of crushing clash. And I mean in that sense, and I don't mean this in a patronizing sense, it is very much like good parenting. right? Of yourself. Yes, of yourself yeah, or whoever you're trying to help. Uh, confront the meaning crisis um, without, as Dan is saying, sort of just dropping this nightmare on them. So that's, so, how, that's so how I would try I, and answer I want to elaborate on that a little bit because John, you know, John brought up this other idea about parables and so I want to tell you about a meta parable because the parables that Christ uh, laid out were embedded in a meta parable and the meta parable, parable ex what expanded itself over 2,000 years into Christianity essentially and so although it has its roots far before Christianity emerged so John said you know you throw someone a little box and you say transform within it it's like okay fine so I would say the way you do that is like we said this earlier pick a problem that bugs you that's why Jiminy Cricket is an insect by the way pick a problem that bugs you that you could solve and solve it now what what Piaget would say that in order to do that, you're going to have to take some of the presuppositions that you're using locally in that box, let them die, that's a kind of sacrifice, and then generate a little local chaos, and then pop up a new solution. And so that's a small death and rebirth. And so the reason that the parables are nested inside the story of death and rebirth is because the idea is that the way that you get to the kingdom of heaven, so good. to speak, is to allow yourself to die and be reborn. And so you should have faith in the part of yourself that can undergo a dissolutive, a dissolutive process in preparation for a rebirth. And that can happen at multiple levels of analysis, micro levels, which is where you should start, man. Start at the micro levels, you know, fix what's at hand. And then if you get good at that, you can start moving up the abstraction chain. And you know, if you get all the way to the top, which you won't because you can't, then the deaths and rebirths are very, very profound and significant. And well, that's a metaphor in many ways, and I don't know how far it extends. I mean, it extends a long ways, but, but that is part of what that drama, and it is a drama, is trying to, is trying to, it's trying to teach us about ourselves. We, we, we formulated the drama to tell us who we are. You know, and so it's no, I, I like that. I mean, I think I really like that notion you just said about the meta parable and Christ exemplifying a parable as a as a background thing to 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 ground his spoken parables. That's quite brilliant. Well done. Um, no, Thank I, you. I, it I, only I, took me like thirty five years to think of it. <laughs> well, well, better you than me because I benefit from that. I mean, that's great. I mean, that's really good. That's very good. Um, I, I I think, and I think I think. Um, your notion about disillusion and, and, and affording, you know, this is, you know, this is dynamical systems theory, yeah, self-organizing yeah. and criticality. It's also what the shaman do. You know, yes, when of course. They go of through course. their transformations. Of course, of they, course. This is what I was going to say, it's ancient shaman. Yeah. And, and I was also saying that I think it's prevalent also in, in the, you know, in the platonic metaphor of people who are trapped in, you know, in the cave and they, they've been trapped so that they're always looking at the shadows and hearing the echoes and they have to make their way out. And, and they make their way a little bit, and they're initially blinded, but their eyes accommodate. And then that allows them to go a little bit farther, and then that blinds them, and then their eyes accommodate. And then that affords them to go a little bit farther, and you do the ascension, you do the anagoge out towards where you're in the real world looking at the sun. And I think that's the way you do it with people. Again, well, and then once you've looked at the sun, you take the light home and you distribute it to people who are in the darkness. Well, the problem, as Plato said, is when you go back down, if you go back down too rapidly, your eyes 
your eyes have to reverse accommodate too. Mm -hmm. If you go back, I mean, Plato said it first, way before man for man, you're blinded by the light, right? <laughs> and you, you have to, but if you go back too soon, they're gonna kill you like they killed yeah. Socrates. Yeah. Yeah. So Dan, there's just as much problem on, of responsibility on the teacher as there is on the people being taught. They can suffer also a kind of catastrophic event if they come back down from the sun. I, I'm not putting myself in that place of enlightenment, but you know what I'm trying to say. I'm right. pretty much done. That's our time. Good. So. <laughs> good work. Very good.